Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four generations the stud has arrived old school or new fan this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories i want those people out there at home to hear the stud sit back and enjoy the ride with the tennessee stud the tennessee stud You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. All right, let's get going. Hey, everybody, welcome in. It's David Summers. It's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Now, let's get back into the ring, back into time. We get wall to wall, treetop tall with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller, hanging in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. What's it like on a spring day there, Ron? Oh, Jason, man, it's a beautiful one today. Uh, Blue sky is supposed to go to 83. You know, so uh, we're getting a little warmth. uh, And I'm hoping that we don't jump back into those 30s again, man. Uh, You know, that's. That kind of happens in this part of the country sometimes. You never know about it. I'll tell but, you what. Uh, we, we beautiful don't, today. That's 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 what's important, I guess. Good deal. We don't worry about that here because we're we're already almost summertime. So we're getting in upper 80s already. And welcome to South Alabama. That's just how it goes. Hey, listen, Ron, what a great stud cast the last one was. You dropped a couple of bombs on us at the end, I guess, simply because there was so much going on in both territories in May of 1979. Well, that's a fact for sure, Dave. <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, Harley Race is coming back for three events uh, that we're going to be talking about. Actually, in the next two, two studcasts, we'll be talking about these Harley events. And uh, Hulk, uh, obviously, was catching on fire. Ox Baker was being added to what was already an extremely talented Billy Spears family down there in the Gulf Coast. Mm-hmm. So now he's got Ox and the Hulk. And then the meeting uh, at the end of the last stud cast uh, in the Knoxville territory between Bob Roop and I uh, began to uh, make it pretty obvious, man, that something really bad was happening in the Knoxville territory. Well, as has been the case for the last six or eight stud casts, probably things in southeastern Gulf Coast territory had really been going great. While in southeastern Knoxville, it was anything but great. So we might as well just jump right in, stud. I'm sure this one is going to be full of history, as they all are, and they all have been lately, of course. So where do we ride? How do we get this thing started this week? Well, I kind of think we should start today with maybe the title of this studcast. And uh, the title of this one is Harley Defends in May 1979. So he's in for three shows over a two weekend period of time. Uh, in his first match for the NWA world title uh, is going to be in this stud cast. A couple of the others may be in the next one. It took place this one on Friday night, May 18th in the Knoxville Coliseum. And he was wrestling me for the NWA world championship. So before we ride there though, I want to take a deep dive into the why of this title match with me against Harley Race rather than Ronnie Garvin, especially since I hadn't even wrestled in the Tennessee Territory for almost two months preceding this. And uh, so then I, w- I want to give everyone the card for that May 18th, 1979 event. Uh, Harley's uh, first title defense that month uh, in the Territory. And the TV that promoted it, we'll talk about the results of that card and the attendance. We're going to start out basically up north in Knoxville. And we're going to ride south, man, into what was a red-hot Gulf Coast territory uh, with a very special match in Dothan, Alabama, on a very unusual Thursday night, May the 17th, 1979, between me and the Hulk. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, mm -hmm. so uh, the winner of that match was going to get an NWA title shot against Harley the following Friday night in the Gulf Coast Territory. So we're going to focus on that May 17th, 1979 card in Dothan. We're usually in Mobile, but we're going to stay on Dothan because it's getting these world title matches. That's the only place in the Southern Territory down there that got them. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about that, that 1979, uh, May 17th, Dothan card. With, uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll discuss the TV that promoted it and the results of that card. And we'll talk about the attendance in Dothan again. And then hopefully we're going to have time for a learning tree question this week. Well, obviously it sounds like you've got this thing loaded down and packed to the gills as we get on the road big time. So you were wrestling against the Hulk in Dothan to see who was going to wrestle Harley race there for the NWA title the next week. Then you went 500 miles North the next night to Knoxville to wrestle Harley there for the world title too. So we will get to Knoxville for the NWA world title in this one. But first, I think you said you'd like to explain why you think Bob Roop wanted you to meet Harley Race rather than Ronnie Garvin, who was the Southeastern champion in the Knoxville Territory. So you, you want to start there, Stud? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's great. And to, to do that properly, Dave, uh, I think we need to go back to the last stud cast here. Uh, when we were talking about Bob Roop and knocking on my door, coming in and laying out all this list of grievances, uh, things that were going wrong, things that the dresser didn't like, things that he didn't like. And he started off with the ticket sellers stealing money in both, not just the small cities, but at the Coliseum. And, uh, and I was very sure that that was not the case in the smaller cities because I had Mac McMurray, man, who uh, I was extremely trusted him, and he was in charge of handling ticket sales in all those smaller cities. Did a great job. He had two great ladies that were very honest people. I knew there was nothing to that. And as far as the Coliseum ticket sellers stealing money, uh, I let uh, Rube know that my company had never sold the first ticket at a Coliseum show, nor had any other event that ever booked that building. The Coliseum had the sole rights to sell every ticket and was bonded by the city to prove the accuracy of their count. If you, if you didn't like what you thought you saw, you know, they'd, they'd, uh, they, the city would, would stand for it, being honest. So, uh, you know, when I told him that, uh, you know, Root was kind of dumbfounded, man. Uh, he wasn't expecting an explanation that good, I don't think. Uh, and, then, and then he, he kind of fumbled on to the next subject. Uh, about the wrestlers, you know, and uh, being angry about their payoffs, uh, being less than what they should be. So, you know, I answered that with the fact that uh, that I got a weekly account of the houses for every event and business had fallen off in all the cities. He knew that. He, I didn't have to convince him of that. And uh, so and, and then I said, that, you know, the wrestlers payoffs are based upon the size of the crowds. And uh, Bob, only a good booker can change the size of the crowds. I mean, so if the if the wrestlers are going to get paid more and uh, and make more money, uh, that's going to be based upon your performance. <laughs> and uh, and again, he dropped that subject and he <laughs> went to the strangest subject of all in this conversation that we oh had. He insisted that I wrestle Harley Race in both of Harley's Knoxville bookings. Uh, that meant that I was going to wrestle Harley Race. Twice in seven <laughs> days. Once on a Friday night, May the 18th, and come back on the following Thursday on May the 24th. God, did, did Roop think it was, this was your first rodeo? I don't, that's just crazy. I remember this brief discussion from last week. So let's start with the first part. Why would he suggest the ticket sellers, sellers were stealing and the payoffs were lower than they should be if that wasn't the case? What, we, what was he drumming up? Well, that, that's exactly what I asked myself, man, uh, when, when he brought this up, you know. Uh, and, and I still had no idea what was going on, obviously, behind closed doors in, in my own territory. I didn't know what was coming. 
and uh, that there was a lot of uh, activity going on that was going to change my life, man, big time. And at this point in May of 1979, after breaking down the lock, the last Knoxville cards in the last few stud casts, I've been doing that every stud cast and explaining how poorly each of those cards were booked going match by match. I honestly believe Root couldn't be that dumb. You know, like you said, <laughs> and, and I thought he was intentionally trying to get himself fired. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so and looking back now, you know, I think he, uh, Ronnie Garvin at this point, Bob Orton Jr., Ron Wright, the great Malenko, uh, <laughs> whose real name was Larry Simon. They were already planning this at this point to try and get the entire crew on board to take over Southeastern wrestling. And if they could get them all or as many as possible to leave the territory and then to, to join their company, it'd leave me with few or maybe even no wrestlers. I mean, they would, it would be easy if they could get that done. So uh, then their chances of making this successful takeover would have been much greater. So my guess is at this point in this stud cast, and we're only three weeks away from the split uh, and uh, the war actually beginning, uh, Bob Roop uh, had already had private conversations, I think, at this point with many of the crew individually about their plans. I don't think he set them all down. I think he went to them one at a time, depending on who he thought might be uh, willing to hear this conversation and not come running to me with it. Uh, so he he was he was getting the ball rolling on this takeover. And, and I'm sure his complaint to me about the wrestlers being upset about the bad playoffs, the bad payoffs. That wasn't true. Uh, he probably put that idea that they were getting these bad payoffs into their heads to intentionally start a problem, you know. So it was a good excuse for him to use because uh, he wanted to if you wanted to create a problem in your crew, uh, that's the best place to start is, man, get them complaining about the money. So there was always thoughts of that kind uh, among wrestlers in many territories, especially those territories that were known for not paying the wrestlers what they had coming. There was a lot of territories where wrestlers always thought they were getting cheated. But uh, that was a difficult sale for him in Southeastern because no one made that claim there. I mean, we had we were famous for good payoffs, so we didn't have that problem. So I'm sure he made a big point to all of them about this meeting he was having with me before he came. And uh, and he probably said, look, I'm going to go uh, have a meeting with Ron. I'm going to tell him all these problems that we're having. And, uh, and you know, I'm going to bring it to his attention, you know, and uh, and, that, and that he was going to make sure that I treated him right. I can just hear him say, you know, I'm going to make sure that he does the right thing with you guys. And uh, and if I didn't, uh, you know, uh, there would be, he said, you know, he would have probably said, and if he don't make it right, guys, there's another option here for you. Right. Right. So I imagine he went back to them immediately after, after the meeting with me and said, uh, I didn't believe any of it. And, and uh, especially about the stealing of the ticket sales. And, uh, and I didn't know any of them, any money. <laughs> wow. It just gets worse and worse. It seems like the hole he's digging. He's just, he just keeps going. What a conniving, horrible person he was. So why would he, why would, why would he possibly want to suggest you take both of the two up and coming back to back Harley race matches, especially after you're being out of the ter territory for almost two months. So why not give them both or at least one of them to Ronnie Garvin? As we said, I think he was the champion in Southeastern Knoxville. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I know the answer to that one because I heard it, man, uh, from the guys in the root crew after the split came, most of those guys in the territory stayed with me. And then they told me a lot of things that had been mentioned at this point. And when they decided to stay with Southeastern, you know, he had insisted that I take both matches, uh, say, in Ronnie Garvin. His, his excuse was in this conversation that we had that Ronnie Garvin had said he wanted to see if I could put as many asses in the seats as he had the last two times <laughs> Harley came in the territory and he wrestled me. <laughs> so, you know, the wrestlers that stayed with Southeastern told me, uh, he also <laughs> said to them in this conversation about this, uh, you know, about this Ronnie Garvin and me wrestling both 
both of the te- matches with uh, Harley, he said that my ego was so huge that I demanded to get both matches. And I told him that I didn't care what the attendance was or what the wrestlers got paid. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, you know, he went and told them that. I mean, you know, <laughs> he was pulling out all the stops, man. He, he, they wow. were ready to try to take this thing over. Yeah. And he thought, man, if I can just get a big portion of this crew to go with us, uh, with this thing will be easy. So in addition to that, I think Root wanted, and I really think he expected that both of the crowds for these Harley matches with me were going to be extremely small. And, uh, then he would also have the ability then to say to the crew, I told you so, you know, his ego cost us all money <laughs> and now look at your payoff. All right, that's crazy because, listen, you at one point, Southeastern Knoxville is doing so well. People were begging to come to your territory because word gets out among wrestlers. What, what was it you always would say? Tele, uh, telephone, telegraph, tell a wrestler. Because, yeah. because the wrestlers were saying, dude, Ron is taking care of us in Knoxville. The payouts were incredible, especially compared to any other territory. That's Wow, that is crazy. Okay, this is a great beginning to this one, Stud. So who was on this first Knoxville Harley race card? I think the date is May 18th, 1979. Right. It's one of the first of the two matches uh, in seven days with Harley raced. And uh, and this card was a very good one, Dave. I mean, it had seven matches on it. Uh, Terry Gibbs opened it up against Mr. Fuji, who was managed by Ron Wright. Mike Graham from the Florida Territory. Came in uh, and defended his United States Junior Heavyweight Championship belt against Kevin Sullivan, uh, the Southern Heavyweight Champion, who was now in the Memphis Territory. My One of my stars, the Mongolian Stomper, came home to defend against Ken Lucas. The Continental Wrestling Association Champion, Thunderbolt Patterson, defended against the Great Malenko. Southeastern Tag Champions, Bob Root and Bob Orton Jr., Defended against Crusher Blackwell and Dean Ho. The Southeastern Championship was on the line. Ronnie Garvin defending against a big-time talent who was making his first appearance ever in Southeastern, a Russian named Alexei Smirnov. Uh, The main event was for the NWA world title, Harley Race, defending against me. All right, that is a spectacular card. Six championship matches. Must have been a really good TV to promote this. So who did you have on the TV? Well, just about everybody on the card was on the TV, to be honest with you. Uh, Because it was a rating period month, uh, this TV opened with a championship match. The very first match on this one was a championship match. And it was the Continental Wrestling Association champion, Thunderbolt Patterson, defending his belt on TV against a very unpopular heel uh, kid named Larry Cheatham. That had cut my caused my brother to get his head cut bald uh, <laughs> uh, and a couple of years back, and uh, he was kind of back in the territory. In fact, my brother had beat him, I think, on the last show. So uh, Larry Cheatham got a shot at uh, Thunderbolt Patterson's Continental Wrestling Association uh, Champions Championship right on television. <laughs> the great Malenko, who is going to be wrestling against Thunderbolt Patterson on the next card, he joined less at the set. And he watched his upcoming opponent. And uh, as always, Boris bragged that he was going to win one of the few titles he had never held. This is it, man. I'm going to now be the be the Continental Wrestling champion. So uh, then uh, Les said, Patterson, uh, while all this is going on and the Malenko's doing his thing, he said, Patterson, man, showed off his unique wrestling style, which he really had. He was really unique, I tell you. It was unreal to watch Thunderbolt. You never knew what was going to happen. And uh, he said that uh, Patterson uh, capped it off, man, with a big win uh, while Boris is bragging about he's going to win the belt. He said uh, it didn't look like he was going to have any chance to beat Patterson. So uh, then the great Malenko, you know, then the second TV segment uh, featured a new tag team combination that really got the studio up, man, into it. Uh, Les said uh, Crusher Blackwell and Dino entered the studio to a big roar. I was down south, TV in uh, the Gulf Coast Territory, so I didn't get to see this, but Les and I always talked about it. He said Bob Roop and Bob Orton Jr. came to the set, 
uh, with him during the match. They brought their Southeastern tag belts. And uh, Les said he reminded them that they had not defended their belts in the last four weeks and that uh, the reason they were defending them now is because you guys, if you don't defend them on this card, you got to give up the titles. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were kind of in a, in a spot to where uh, they had to to defend their championship. Hmm. Then, uh, then they claimed, uh, you know, they, they got upset and upset about the, this being, uh, you know, the first title defense of the month. Uh, and it, and it was against a loser like Crusher Blackwell. I mean, they can't, how does he get into this match? Right. So, so Crusher and Dean, Ho, they paid no attention to this, to what was going on to the set. They both were in the ring and, uh, that 400 and, 50, 400 pound plus Crusher Blackwell. He jumped off the top rope on a kid, man. Les said it looked like a guy went through the mat, disappeared, you know, uh, and that uh, finished that match. So uh, uh, it left a, by, you know, Roop and Orton sitting there watching that, and I don't think they felt too good about the possibility of having that done to them. Then the personality profile was all about the NWA world title match. With me against Harley. Mm -hmm. uh, this TV that we're talking about today was uh, recorded on Saturday, May the 12th. Uh, three days prior to this TV, I was in the Gulf Coast Territory down in Mobile, the Expo Hall, and uh, I recorded an interview in the dressing room that night, which was May the 9th, 1979. And I recorded my thoughts about Harley Race and about this upcoming NWA world title match. I sent it out to uh, FedEx the next morning to the Knoxville TV station. And on that same day that I was recording in Mobile, Harley Race was in St. Louis in the National Wrestling Alliance office of President Sam Muchnick. And Harley recorded his interview uh, about the upcoming match in Knoxville. And he mm -hmm. sent it out to the Knoxville TV station uh, that same day. Wow. So Les Thatcher, three days later, uh, he played these Two interviews and the personality profile from uh, both of the contestants in the NWA championship match. Uh, then, uh, then those two uh, interviews were cut, strangely enough, 700 miles apart. Me down on the Gulf Coast, Harley in St. Louis. Uh, there was the same prediction basically from both of us in the interviews. Uh, Les said, uh, Harley said pretty much the same thing I did, you know, and I said that this wasn't going to be a normal world title match that I was not going to be, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be a time limit draw hmm. in the last hmm. 60 minutes. It was probably going to be a nasty, probably a bloody match that was going to show how we felt, how I felt about Harley. And Harley ended up making an interview <laughs> that said kind of the same thing. You know, I'm tired of this, Ron Fuller. You know, <laughs> I, this is this ain't going to be pretty. So Les said it really set the stage, man, for a totally different world title match than any that we'd ever had in Knoxville before. Wow. What is it they say about great minds think alike? And listen, uh, the persona of Harley Race before Hulk Hogan, to me, the persona of the man was just incredible, just to the presence of Harley Race. And, and I'm curious, how many world title matches in Knoxville had you been in with Harley Race before this one? Well, this was the third one. Hmm. The first one was in April of 1977. It was the all-time largest crowd ever for a sports event in the Coliseum, period. Before, or still there, still the record. Uh, the second time uh, was a year later, in May of 1978. Both of those first two were 60-minute time limit draws. Uh, there wasn't anybody bleeding in either one of those matches uh, but this one was going to be a completely different deal. Okay, to, to me, every NWA world title match was tremendous. After this profile, I have no doubt this one was going to be really special. So how did the rest of the TV go after that? Well, Ken Lucas joined Les to set. Uh, he watched uh, a recent win uh, that was sent to him uh, from Memphis, uh, uh, where a Mongolian stomper won the South the Southern Heavyweight Championship from uh, from uh, <laughs> old, uh, the Jerry Lawler man. So uh, you know, and uh, uh, Mongolian Stomper was managed obviously by Gorgeous George Jr. It was the first time fans had seen the Stomper in nine months in this live event, and uh, it, it, in nine months, it back as far as the Mink Coat Tournament that took place on the first day of September of 1978. 
since the fans had seen the stomper. And Les said the crowd seemed to miss him, man, and they kind of cheered when they watched him beat Jerry Lawler because Jerry Lawler was a big heel in Knoxville and had been yeah. for years. Yeah. So, you know, but Ken Lucas was a really smart baby face. Uh, he, he, was, he was always very humble. So, you know, Lucas was smart enough. He, he put Stomper over, man, saying that the Mongolian Stomper was one of the best wrestlers in the world, and nobody could deny that, and that he appreciated even having the opportunity to wrestle such a well-known opponent and for such a special belt. And uh, then Ken went into the ring, and uh, he stood that studio up, Les said, man, and uh, he put his uh, sleeper hold which he was famous for on the guy and left him laying. He said, wow, <laughs> Lucas was over. Uh, TV ended with Ronnie Garvin coming to the set. He was wearing his Southeastern belt, and he was carrying his newly won TV championship trophy from Bob Roof that he had won the Friday before. And they had this match in where it was for the belt and the trophy. The winner got both of them. Ronnie had won that match. So w- Ronnie then watched his next opponent. Uh, who was making his Southeastern debut. Debut, first time I'd ever seen him. He's on TV. Man, this guy was very impressive. It was the Russian, uh, Alexis Smirnov. And uh, Les said Smirnov silenced the studio crowd at the end of the match. And he said even Ronnie got quiet because Smirnov did a series of moves that uh, Les said I'd never seen before. And I know Ronnie had never seen them before. He goes, and uh, he ended that match so tough that he said they had to carry that guy out of the ring. Wow. So uh, then Ronnie Garvin and Alexis Smirnoff made the last interview for the show. All right. So that sounds like a much better TV stud. But with a card like this one, how could it not have been? So what happened the next Friday night when Harley Race came to town to, fin- to defend his belt? Well, Mr. Fuji, managed by Ron Wright, won his last Southeastern match against Terry Gibbs. Mr. Fuji was like another one of those boys in the Southeastern Territory. He was on his way to Memphis. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's going to team up with uh, Tora Tanaka. Wait, are are you kidding, Ron? They were still (laughs) getting your Southeastern talent there? (laughs) (laughs) Can you believe me? Yes, they were. How generous can you be? Wow. Hey man, you know, uh, but they were beginning to have problems there over the payoff situation. Uh, I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, you know, there was a big disagreement at this point between my brother and my father and Jerry Jarrett, the owners of the territory, about the percentage of the house that was going to be paid to the wrestlers. Uh, there was something going on there that wasn't good. And uh, we're going to talk about that again, maybe next podcast. Uh, is it, you know, that's going to that thing is going to continue to eat up, and it's going to go go really sour for all of them. Uh, the first championship match of the night uh, on this big event got the evening off to a great start. Uh, uh, this was the first of six, I think it was six title matches. That's a huge card. Uh, it was Mike Graham, United States Junior Heavyweight Champion, who was from Florida. Uh, he had uh, lost his, you know, he had uh, he lost his belt in this match to his former partner, who was used to be. They were a hot little tag team, Mike Graham and Kevin Sullivan, about the same size. Uh, what a great tag team, young guys down there in Florida when I was there between seventy and seventy four. So Mike comes up here, he wrestles his former partner, and uh, I'm sitting in the dressing room for this first championship match, and I hear a tremendous pop, man. Wow, when Kevin beat Mike Cram, the U.S. Mm. Junior Championship. Mm -hmm. Then Ken Lucas uh, got his hand raised in the Southern Championship match against the Stomper, but, uh, you know, he won by disqualification, and obviously he couldn't get the belt. Thunderbolt Patterson retained his Continental Wrestling Association belt, uh, and uh, the great Malenko got disqualified in that match. So uh, that's how Patterson hung on to his belt. Crusher Blackwell and Dean Ho won the Southeastern Championship match, but also by disqualification from Bob Root and Bob Borden Jr., so they didn't get the belts either. Uh, Then uh, Ronnie Garvin's match, that shocked that Coliseum crowd. Uh, Ronnie Garvin lost his Southeastern belt right in the middle of the ring, man, to this impressive newcomer, uh, Alexis Smirnoff. Nobody was expecting that. Wow. Uh, Okay. 
All right, Ryan. So what happened on that big NWA World Championship match between you and the man, Harley Race? Well, Dave, I, it was the wildest world title match I, I think I ever had. Uh, the, the Knoxville newspapers, the following day, uh, they had a description in, in, uh, <laughs> of it. And, uh, and I looked back and found this old uh, little article about uh, the results of the match. Mm -hmm. And their description of the match was, and I quote, the match was stopped because it was too bloody to continue. Wow. And listen, that's crazy because obviously nowadays you just don't get wrestling write-ups in newspapers. I've never heard anything like that, especially in a newspaper after a match. It had to be extremely violent. Well, man, it, it certainly was, Dave. Wow. I, I remember I wore yellow trunks into the ring, and when I came out of the ring, my trunks were red. Wow. Harley was bloody. Uh, one time I remember toward the end of the match, <laughs> I was standing looking at him. He was bloody from his head all the way down to his thighs. Wow. The, the building was on his feet for almost the entire 30-minute match uh, before they stopped the match. They finally rang the bell, and uh, and we were – it was what? It was with the, one of the bloodiest matches I was ever in. All right. I've been waiting to ask this question Stud, since we started this one. So what about the attendance – in the first of two back-to-back -back Harley race matches with you in Knoxville in May of 1979? Well, um, you know, the first match was reported by the Knoxville newspaper, this first one for the world title, as a, and, and this was another quote, 5,400 crazy fans. They said it was one of the largest crowds for a sporting event ever in the building's history. It was only about 200 short of that all-time figure uh, in 1977. And, and I want to do something fans always like, Dave. Uh, I want to break this house down. Uh, now, let's talk about the ticket prices. To, to, to really get into uh, the, what the gross house figure was, so we had championship prices on this card because it was another NWA world title match. The first two rows of ringside were what we called the golden circle. Each one of those tickets were $20. The next four rows of ringside were $10 each seat. The remaining ringside was $7 each. There was 2,200 ringside seats in that building. They had the entire floor covered practically. Uh, there was a thousand fans sitting on risers mm -hmm. that were in the ringside area. So the average price of those ringside tickets was $10 a seat. And uh, so 2,200 of those, that equal $22,000. Wow. The first balcony tickets were $7 each. Uh, we sold 800 of them, all of them, 800 seats in that first balcony. Mm -hmm. uh, that figure equaled 5,600. The general admission tickets averaged $5 to see, and there were 2,400 of those sold, and uh, they were all full. That's another 12000 So that made the total gross house uh, $39,600. Uh, that $39,600 in 1979 yeah, yeah. would be worth $175,000 today. Wow. I, I got to ask you. You mentioned Golden Circle. Isn't that something? Isn't that a concept that you started in Knoxville when you first got there? Kind of rearranging how you sell tickets and getting the best bang for the buck on tickets? Yeah. I mean, I, well, I was the first to do a, what was called the Golden Circle. And right. uh, it's, everybody could do it one row. Some people did it for three rows yeah. after me. But yeah. uh, I was the first one to ever have the guts to charge twenty dollars back in the seventies, man, <laughs> for a ringside seat. Yeah, yeah. You know? And and then when I first advertised that day, uh, and uh, I told the boys about it, the, the wrestlers they went, uh, "Ron, you're not going to have anybody in the first row." <laughs> yeah, but you know what was funny? Uh, they were the first seats sold. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Were, I bet. Yeah. The first seat wow. sold was the twenty dollars seats. They were gone in no time. Uh, yeah. So I went from one row to two rows on this one. Yeah. Instead of just one one row of golden circle, it's a two rows of golden circle. Yeah, you sell it out first. That kind of keeps them quiet. So, man, th I tell you what, this is a great a great way to end the first part of this studcast. I love the crowd size and the comments about about how you broke that down. I think that's amazing. 
I wonder what Bob Roop was thinking when he saw this. He must have felt like the biggest idiot. Those numbers are absolutely remarkable. And you didn't have to say a word because those numbers told the tale. All right. So when we return after the break, we're going to ride south into a territory that is unbelievably on fire. That is coming up when this studcast continues. Okay, Studcast fans, if you know the stud, Ron Fuller, you know he loves to mingle and hang out with you on Twitter and on Facebook, but he likes nothing better to get with you guys face-to-face, get pictures, all kind of stuff. And you've got, Ron, you've got a couple of opportunities happening this weekend in Knoxville. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, man, uh, uh, this Saturday, May the 13th, I'm going to be one of the many heroes and legends at the Wrestling Fan Fest being held in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, just outside Gatlinburg. Uh, it's going to be held at the Smoky Mountain Convention Center. It's going to start at noon. It'll be over by 6, or I will be leaving there by 6. They actually have matches that start there at 7 o'clock. And uh, I'm going to have my own table there. Uh, I'm going to have souvenirs. I'll have some 8 by 10 photos, some T-shirts of all kinds, and a whole lot more things. So uh, drop by and say hello. Then on the following weekend, on Friday, May 19th, I'm going to be making a special appearance at the Harriman Heat Wrestling event in Harriman, Tennessee, which is just south of Knoxville. Uh, I'm going to be there as a commentator on the TV wrestling show. And uh, I'm also going to be uh, sitting next to my good friend, Tom Pritchard, who's also going to be commentating with me. And uh, this is going to be held at the Harriman High School. Starts at 7 o'clock, and it'll feature matches some of the best young wrestlers in Tennessee, some of uh, Tom Pritchard's wrestling students will be on this as well. And uh, it's also going to uh, feature uh, the Knoxville's county mayor, Glenn Jacobs. WWE's Kane is going to be there, man, because he lives right there in that Knoxville area. And uh, there'll be a lot of other stars there, too. And I'm also going to be appearing uh, on a on a on a podcast uh, with Joe Kazana, uh, this Friday on May the 12th, uh, and this podcast can be heard on his website, Joe Kazana Promotions and YouTube. Uh, Joe's the grandson of John Kazana, who is the wrestler that I purchased my first territory from mm-hmm. that became Southeastern Wrestling in 1974. So Joe's the promoter for responsible for this big event on Friday night, uh, May the 19th, uh, the one I just mentioned. And if you're anywhere near the Knoxville area, come on out and say hello. That's cool. Ron, you're going to have souvenirs. You got T-shirts. You got pictures and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. All right. So but what if, I, what if I bring my cell phone and you and I hook up, we get a picture made? Oh, heck yeah, man. I, 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 I welcome it. Like you said, Dave, I do really, really love these appearances. And uh, this is an opportunity I really spend to to really meet the fans. And and folks, remember, Studcast fans, remember, Ron is 6'9", so bring your own stilts for the picture. Okay. (laughs) All right, Ron, you're busy. I love how you love to hang out with the fans in person and how you spend time with fans. You answer all the questions on Facebook, on, on Twitter, and that kind of thing on social media. I think that's fantastic. All right, listen, we are now back. We're back in the Southeastern Gulf Coast Territory. The focus card there for this studcast is Dothan, Alabama, which I'm in Webb, Alabama. That's where the WTBY TV studios were once. They're now in downtown Dothan. So as the crow flies, I'm only about seven miles from Dothan. The same city that the first Andre and Hulk match actually took place. You might think, wait, well, no, wait, WrestleMania three in front of 93,000 in the Pontiac. No, that was not the first match by far. It was going to be the site. This was going to be the site of the only defense in May of 1975, 79, by the way, by Harley race in that territory. So let's go over the card for Dothan, Alabama. What was once known as a hotbed of wrestling on a very unusual Thursday night, May 17th, 1979. Oh, man. Uh, and Dothan was a tremendous wrestling town. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, uh, every wrestler that ever went there loved that town, loved wrestling there. Uh, some of the greatest fans on earth in Dothan, Alabama. Yeah. Uh, so it was the same card uh, 
this uh, this card on Thursday night, uh, May the seventeenth, was going to be the same card basically it was in that was in Montgomery and Mobile, except for one match, and that match was going to be the main event. So uh, this uh, this card, uh, and it's before Harley comes there. Actually, uh, going to be Russ and Hulk to see who meets Harley. So on this card, uh, the opening match was Terry Latham against Herb Calvert. Uh, Ricky Fields was facing off against Eddie Sullivan, who was managed by Billy Spears. Uh, for the Continental Wrestling Association Championship, Thunderbolt Patterson, the same one we talked about earlier, was headed south. He was going to be defending against Ox Baker, managed by Billy Spears. The mm-hmm. Southeastern Tag Belts were on the line. The champions, the Samoans, managed by Billy Spears, were defending against a new team down there in the uh, southeastern Gulf Coast, the Wrestling Pros, one and two. Uh, the southeastern title was at stake. Uh, champion Ron Slinker was against the Gladiator, managed by Billy Spears. And the main event in Montgomery and Mobile was a Texas death match between me and the Hulk. Mm. But in Dothan, uh, on that Thursday night, the match was for something much more important. We were going against each other there, uh, but the winner got the shot at the uh, following Friday night at the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Harley Grace. Wow, that is an incredible card in all three of the Gulf, Gulf Coast major cities. But obviously, Dothan's match between you and the Hulk had a bigger prize for the winner. So how about the Southeastern Gulf Coast TV, May 12th, 1979. Dothan TV was always very exciting. Well, this one opened with the introduction of the Continental Wrestling Association uh, champion, Thunderbolt Patterson. Uh, and it actually came right out of the introduction with the wrestlers locking up the old, uh, uh, the great in- the great intro to our wrestling show way back in the day. Uh, as soon as that finished, it went right straight to Thunderbolt Patterson. He made an interview about his first visit to the southeastern Gulf Coast, and he was going to be defending against one of the most dangerous men in wrestling, Ox Baker. Well, when the interview ended, then it came to the set. And uh, the interview uh, and the show opened. It had Billy Spears and Ox Baker at the set with Charlie Platt. Uh, the day, and there's Ox Baker who's going to be wrestling against uh, Thunderbolt Patterson. And uh, they also uh, watched the interview uh, with Spears, uh, t- you know, taking a, taking a shot, basically, <laughs> as usual, man, uh, coming right out of the interview. He didn't let Charlie get into it. He just <laughs> tore right into Thunderbolt Patterson. And uh, he said Patterson was right about his new man that Ox Baker was the most dangerous wrestler in the world, and Patterson was going to lose his belt this coming week in the southeastern area. Wow. So when Charlie finally got a chance to welcome everybody to the TV show after Billy had got his th- – after uh, Patterson had done his interview, Billy got his word in. Uh, then he turned and uh, – Charlie turned and he asked Spears a question about uh, how well he, he knew Thunderbolt. What do you know about Thunderbolt Patterson? Well, Spears, you know, being the ass he always was, you know, he he didn't even answer. He just got up and took Ox to the ring. Ox was in the first match on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, First time fans had ever seen Ox wrestle and he was on TV. Ox, man, was looking fearsome, as he always did. I mean, wow, he was scary. And uh, he just basically uh, destroyed a young wrestler that was facing him. And then uh, Spears, at the end of it, just bolted into the ring, man. He was, his face was just red. He was gushing with glee, man. His new monster had made a great, great uh, uh, first impression. And he and his mama were so happy with it, you know. (laughs) And it was a great start to a TV show, man, especially in the rating period. And it was a super way to get Ox over for his first TV match. So Spears was back again. Now, he's managing so many people at this point. His family is huge. So uh, he's back at, again, the opening of the second TV segment. And this time, he had his giant Samoans with him, their tag team belts. uh, And in the ring was a new team at the Southeastern. One of these guys was a new to him. Uh, Man, he was a very popular wrestler there, the wrestling pro. But the pro had found himself a partner, had a white mask on, white outfit, looked just like the original pro. Hmm. And uh, they were going to be uh, 
and they were introduced as the wrestling pros one and two. Mm. They're going to be going up against the Samoans. So the studio was kind of blown away, man, with this surprise appearance of the second uh, wrestling pro. And, uh, you wow. know, they gave the new team a big ovation, and Spears is at the set uh, with his men. And obviously, again, as he always did, he tore into the masked man immediately. He asked uh, Charlie why they were already booked to wrestle his team for the belts. You know, he was upset that Southeastern – would give an untested team, I think is the way he called it, an untested team a shot at his Samoans' belts. Wow. You know? So, but the pro looked great, man. And, uh, wow, they, both of those guys did. They got a great win, man, for the first time on TV. Yeah, listen, I got to say, the wrestling pro, was he was my favorite then, Leon, uh, the late Leon Tarzan Baxter, and we saw him a few years ago uh, before he passed away at, at, at one of the reunions. Leon Baxter, he had a suplex like anything I've ever seen. He would take them straight up and hold them there. And then and the crowd, the anticipation was incredible. So he knew how, man, he knew how to electrify the crowd. Just an amazing personality and an even better wrestler. So, wow, that's a, that's historical right there. All right, so this TV, you got it obviously off to a great start. But the personality profile is always a good one. What'd you have there? Well, for the third week in a row, man, we were going to have to do two profiles in this show. Uh, and the reason for that was because Harley was going to wrestle in just one match in Dothan in that TV market alone. So the Montgomery and Mobile markets were going to have a different personality profile uh, in their shows mm. uh, promoting their main event, which was going to be a Texas death match between me and the Hulk, but the Dothan market profile was going to promote the winner of the match between me and the Hulk getting the Harley race, uh, yeah. world championship match. It's always uh, amazing weeks down the road. Yeah. That big main event was coming. So it's always amazing to me how you could weave this thing. It, it might sound a little complicated, but since the cards were not exactly the same, it must've been the, the only way to handle it. So, so how did you do the, those profiles that day? Well, because the Dothan market was where we did the show, and it was also, uh, you know, the where we had our TV crowds. We had people sitting there, and it was the only market that was going to get the Harley race match. You know, uh, so we shot that Dothan profile live in front of the fans. Uh, I was sitting with Charlie, and uh, right beside uh, us was a van, the bleachers full of fans, man. And uh, so this profile... Uh, had two recorded interviews in it. Uh, one was with Billy Spears and the Hulk, uh, which we did earlier in the day before the fans ever got into the studio. The other was an interview from Harley Race that came from another city that he was in during the course of that week and had been sent to the TV station two days earlier. So, uh, and so you know, Here's where the, how, how this was done. Uh, the Dothan market, the personality was done there. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a big hand, obviously, from the studio audience because they're all there and they see it. And uh, when Charlie introduced the profile uh, and talked just briefly about the importance of this upcoming match between me and the Hulk to see who was going to get the NWA World Championship match on Friday, May the 25th, 13 days after the profile, uh, bef as soon as he finished that, he threw it right straight to the director uh, who shot right straight into Billy Spears and the Hulk uh, interviews about this match, the upcoming match. And then Billy Spears uh, appeared in an empty studio, obviously, like I said, the, the nobody was in it, accompanied by the Hulk, and he pushed the fact that his Hulk was going to be the man to beat not just me uh, and win the shot at the world champion, but the man that the following Friday night after that was going to win the world championship. And uh, then when that was over, Charlie threw it to the NWA champion, Harley Race, for his comments. Harley, as, usual, <laughs> as, as always, basically, uh, didn't give a damn who won the match yeah. because he was the <laughs> baddest man on God's yeah, green earth. Got that right. <laughs> it didn't make no difference to him which one of, them, which one of us won. Wow. So uh, – I finished up with my comments, and, uh, and I spoke a little bit about the history of my family. 
and how precious every world championship match was, man, and uh, and what it would mean to me and my family if I were to win that match and become a world heavyweight champion. All right, so a second profile. How did that go? The one that you did in the empty studio after the TV was done, I assume. Well, it was a simple one. Uh, the, and it was exactly the same length as the other profile because it had to fit into that slot exactly. And uh, so, again, I was on the profile set with Charlie for this one. Uh, and in this one, he threw it to Billy Spears and the Hulk again, as he'd done before. But this was going to be a different main event. Spears didn't talk about the upcoming Texas death match uh, because we weren't going to be in that. Uh, his interview was all about the fact that uh, we had a match between me and the Hulk and the winner of that was going to get a shot at a Harley race. So uh, uh, it was a, it was quite a, quite a little deal. And then I got my opportunity to say what I wanted to say after. All right. So it always amazes me to hear how these things were done. So, so who was in the next segment on the TV show? Well, the gladiator managed by Billy Spears was headed into the ring and, and he was also headed for his first shot at the Southeastern title. There was a new Southeastern champion at this point. It was Ron Slinker. He had beaten David Schultz in a loser leave Southeastern match. David Schultz was gone from the territory. Gladiator gets his first shot ever at the Southeastern champion uh, championship and the champion, uh, Ron Slinker. Slinker's uh, belt and all, man, joined Charlie at the set as a gladiator, got another win on TV. Uh, Dick Steinborn was a tremendous wrestler. He was always fun to watch. Wow, he could really go. Uh, the last TV match was the Hulk, managed by Billy Spears. I was at the set with Charlie, and uh, I got to make some comments uh, on that match. And, uh, and then uh, the show had uh, – Open and closed. When you think about it, this is says a great deal about what Billy Spears had going on at this point. This TV show opened up with Ox Baker, Billy Spears' man, and closed with the Hulk. Wow. Billy Spears, man. All right. A really great TV show. So what happened, Dothan, Alabama, on Thursday night, May 17th, 1979, in the legendary Houston County Farm Center? Uh, Terry Lathan. Beat Herb Calvert. Ricky Fields won over Eddie Sullivan. It was managed by Billy Spears. In the Continental Wrestling Association Championship match, Thunderbolt Patterson won by disqualification over Ox Baker, managed by Billy Spears, obviously. Southeastern Tag Championship match between the champion Samoans, managed by Billy Spears, uh, was won by the Samoans against the uh, wrestling pros one and two. Mm-hmm. Ron Slinker won the Southeastern title match by disqualification over the Gladiator, managed by Billy Spears. And the Dothan only main event, me against the Hulk, to see who would wrestle Harley, Bray, Harley Race for the NWA world title the next Friday night. It got off to a bad start, with, uh, especially between Hulk and Spears. Uh, Spears had, a, had the announcer call the Hulk, Sterling the Hulk Golden again. Uh, <laughs> Terry, Terry, Terry didn't like it. He went to the announcer. He made him announce him again as Terry the Hulk Boulder. And then the two of them had a long argument outside the ring. Hulk and, <laughs> and Hulk was really upset with Spears. And finally, Hulk made Spears go back to the dressing room during wow. the match. Wow. The crowd wow. loved it. Wow. He forced him. He okay. said, get your butt out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> so Spears, did, he, didn't, he didn't give him any mouth. He went straight to the dressing room. And, uh, wow, like I said, the crowd loved it. So, uh, you know, Hulk got off to a little bit of a cheer right off the bat. So <laughs> uh, on the end of this match, though, uh, you know, uh, it was me and Hulk, and we'd been going to get at it, I guess, probably for 30 minutes. and. And uh, I collided with the referee, and the referee went down really hard, and I went down too. And then Hulk picked me up, and he put me in his bear hug. Uh, gosh, the building was going crazy at that point, uh, but the referee wasn't able – he wasn't up yet. So uh, mm-hmm. Hulk had to drop me from the bear hug, and he went to help get the referee back on his feet. About that time, Billy Spears comes back to ringside. And he's got something on his fist, you know, and uh, and the Hulk goes back and puts me in the bear hug, but uh, referee's still down, and Spears jumps on the apron, and he motions for the Hulk 
to bring me over to where he was. Whoa. You know? mm -hmm. And then when he got the hook, got me there, he's got me in the bear hook. He, I'm beat, basically. Yeah. You know, he says, you know, throw him down, put him in a full nuss, and I want to hit him. I want to hit him. And uh, so Hulk uh, put me, and he dropped me, and he put me in a full Nelson. And uh, when Spears started to nail me, then, uh, you know, uh, I was in a full Nelson. And, uh, you know, I just ducked, man. And, wow, he smacked the Hulk. <laughs> and uh, Hulk went down. I covered him. The referee counted him out. Holy cow. Wow. All right. So, And, and I want to say a, a, a quick footnote about the Houston County Farm Center. The Eagles played there in the early 70s. Garth Brooks sold it out in two shows in the 90s. So this is a legendary place. It wasn't just wrestling. All right, but here's the thing. You're saying the Hulk had you beat and Billy Spears cost him the shot at Harley Race. So what did the Hulk do after that? Because I can see what was beginning to happen with the Hulk and Spears. Well, you know, I got my hand raised, and uh, and obviously I left the ring, man. I didn't care what went on after that. Uh, the hook finally got up, and uh, wow, he he went he went straight after Billy Spears. Billy saw him coming for him, and he started running. He ran back to the dressing room, and the hook chased him out. I don't know what happened in the dressing room, but while that building was standing up. I want to see Hulk go after him, and Billy Spears, I never saw him run so fast, man. That's a crazy ending to that match. Okay, so it makes me wonder what was coming next. So what about the attendance on that rare Thursday night card? Well, Dothan was on fire, man. Uh, you know, it, that had started basically a couple weeks earlier when Andre wrestled the Hulk. Yeah. And that <laughs> massive crowd, man, 6,000 in there, I think, is what the figure was. And mm -hmm. the building's built for five. You know, but on this crowd, this is a Thursday night. We had 5,000 people in that building. <laughs> so, you know, on a Thursday night, because <laughs> Hulk was really over and because Harley Race is coming. And uh, there's so much going on down there in that southeastern Gulf Coast at that point. Yeah, down there in that blue collar town of Dothan, Alabama, where everybody had to be at work on Friday. But that didn't matter because this was huge. All right, so this has been another another eye-opening stud cast, Ron. I'm sorry we're not going to have time to get that learning tree question in this week. Either way, this stud cast has really been great. So where do we ride next on the next stud cast? Okay, so, uh, you know, it's it's back-to-back -back Harley matches for me, man, in the next uh, stud cast. I mean, uh, one night in uh, – in, uh, in, in, uh, Knoxville, and then next in, in back uh, down in Dothan in world title match. So so after that bloody first match I had with Harley in Knoxville there on, on that Thursday night, uh, you know, uh, on that Friday night, uh, we're going to come back on the next Thursday night, and uh, we're not going to be in a world championship match at all the next uh, on the Thursday night match, we're going to be in a very rare deal for a world champion. I'm going to be wrestling Harley Race in the Texas Death Match, uh, and that card was is going to have four more championship matches on it. Uh, one of those is going to be a world title match, a ladies' world championship match with the old tough as nails, fabulous Moolah man, defending her belt against Winona Little Heart and a. Plus, we've got a southeastern uh, uh, and, and a southeastern tag and a United States uh, title match on that card. Also, David Schultz and Eddie Mansfield are going to be coming back to Knoxville, uh, and they're only one stud cast away from. Uh, and we're we're at this point one stud cast away, basically, from the Knoxville War beginning. So then uh, we're going to head back south into the Gulf Coast again with the last of three southeastern matches uh, that were scheduled for Harley Race in May of 1979. There's going to be a huge surprise in this one, man, for everybody in the Gulf Coast territory, not just Dothan, but everybody in that entire territory. Uh, I'll discuss that basically the start, and we're into the start of this third phase of the Hulk plan that uh, – you know, the plan that me and Louis Toilette had to make him make a star out of him. Uh, and I've been mentioning it. And uh, now it's, it's, it's time we'll be talking about that. And fans will see all that come to come to pass in the next uh, stud cast. And uh, that plan 
is going to culminate on the last week of July 1979 when no building in that entire area is large enough to hold the NWA world title event that's going to happen the last week of July in 1979. It was big, and uh, and it was so big it had to be held in a football stadium. And if anybody understands or knows anything about high school football in the Wiregrass area, the Dothan, Alabama area, folks would come in to play high school football from Mobile, Montgomery, even Birmingham. Rip Hugh Stadium, legendary. It still stands. They've remodeled. The thing looks beautiful. They've got brand new turf. I mean, so so that is going to be epic when that gets here. Hey, listen, the next one sounds like one of the best stud cast ever. So I keep thinking they don't get any better. They can't get any better than this until the next one comes along. I can't wait for it, stud. This has been a lot of fun. All right, folks on Facebook, go to Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. Like him, follow him there to become friends with a living legend. Ron always loves hanging out with you guys on Facebook and Twitter. Same thing on Twitter, Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow him there also. Check out the, the website, tnstud.com. tnstud.com for every stud cast ever done. They're all posted right there. 43 super stud cast and the stud store for all kinds of souvenirs. Get your personally autographed copy of the Brutus novel. You can get that there also, the YouTube channel, Southeastern Rewind, it is red hot. 272 hours of videos there now. The last 77 stud cast, 52 stud stories, 34 short rides with the stud, and four ask the stud question and answer shows. And number five is coming May 20th. So don't, don't forget to put that on your calendar. Subscribe now. YouTube Southeastern Rewind. YouTube Southeastern Rewind. That, of course, is the gateway to ClassicContinentalWrestling.com, the Stud's tremendous streaming channel. There are now more than 250 hours of classic wrestling entertainment. Gulf Coast, Southeastern, Continental, and USA TV shows, all in the order which they were recorded, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Plus 19 chapters of Ron's audio version of his best selling lion novel. Ron, you're still voicing that, right? Yes. And even yes, doing even doing character voices in this thing. Brutus, six stars of the sport, four superstars of the past, and documentaries with something new every day. You gotta check this out. It's only $4.99 per month, or boom, knock it out one time, $39.99 per year. Plus, the free one-week trial is still available. That is ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. It is the best deal in wrestling. All right, Stud, I know you got some final words for us. Well, man, uh, just a big thank you to all of the fans that we have out there listening, man, uh, to uh, these unique historical podcasts that, that I do. And uh, and I want to pass along the word to others Uh uh, you know, if, 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 if you fans like what we do, uh, tell your friends about us and, uh, please take care of yourselves and others and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the great smoky mountains, I'm David Summers saying, thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee stud LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic stud cast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the great smoky mountains.